That song will always tug at my heart, only because I drove the kids to and back from school, and that was the one song that Nolan always wanted to listen to. Uh, and he always sang his heart out to it. But what a tremendous song it is, if you think of it. He's our living hope, is he not? Yes, so he's our living hope. Let's turn to the book of Colossians here. This is where we'll be today. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And the title today is A Thriving Society. A Thriving Society. Let's read it together. And if you're a child, you're dismissed to junior church. Verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your awesomeness. We thank you for your love and grace. Jesus Christ is our living hope. We thank you for him. We thank you for loving us first. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ shedding his blood on that cross for us. Nothing of what we've done. It's all because of him. We thank you for him and we appreciate that, Father. Help us help our lives to, to show appreciation. Help us to walk in newness of life, Father. To share the glorious gospel, the grace of God to the lost. To share that living hope to people we run into through our daily lives and, and such. Father, be with us in, our, in your word. Guide us through it. Be with our children as well in junior church. Be with the teachers there as well. In Jesus' name, amen. The family picture, the family is a picture of the body of Christ and the unity it is to display. It's a picture or an example for others to see Christ in us, the hope of glory. If the family is thriving, so is the society. Unfortunately, our society in the United States right now and others shows other signs of non-thriving culture. But let me say this. With God, what is it? All things are possible. Don't discount God. But see, we have God's blueprints for you and I, for families, for individuals who are not married, Blueprints for you and I to live by so we can have a thriving society. Because when the body of Christ is shining, who is shining? The Lord Jesus Christ. And people see Him. And people see there's something different about us. Something they want and they desire. People desire what? Peace. What's the world looking for? What? Peace. And we have peace through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But first and foremost, this topic ahead of us, it's touching. It will convict. But they're God's words. They're meant to be read. They're meant to be studied. They're meant to be learned from. And they're meant to apply to our own daily lives. So like it or not, we're going to deal with it. So in verse 17... It tells us, whatsoever you do in word and deed, do what? Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. And then He gives instructions for the family. But it starts, obviously, with verse 18. But I want to start with something that is truly needed in our society, but not just in our society, but truly needed in our local church family and in the home setting. Folks, it starts with the man. There's two verses here. Dealing with the Father. Verse 19 and verse 21. Verse 19 says what? Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Verse 21 says, fathers. Dealing with the same individual. 
Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be what? Discouraged. First mercy, if we want to have a thriving society, how can we have a thriving society? I'm telling you right now, men need to stand up. Absolutely. Every guy here needs to stand up to be a living testimony to the lost and to young children out there who are looking for mentors. I don't know the percentage because I can't even look it up on Google because there's so many statistics out there. But I can tell you right now there is a good bit of children out there who do not have fathers in their own homes. Broken families. You know the cause of that? Since the fall of man, what's been in the world? Sin. You know who's really good at messing up the family unit? Satan. And he's been doing it since when? The fall of man. At the Garden of Eden, who was there? The devil. He's a deceiver of all things. And first and foremost, he does not want this passage to be read. And first and foremost, he wants you to, to, re, to reject it. Because society would want you to reject it. Because this is of his world. He's the prince and power of this era. God says you want to have a thriving society. You want to have a thriving family in the home. A thriving church family. It starts with the man standing up. As the head or the leader of the family, in verse 19 and 21, dealing with the father first, and we'll deal with the women next. Don't worry. We need men to stand up. The, the, the man, the husband, is the head, the leader of the family. A, a father has a primary responsibility for raising his children. Of course, the mother does as well. They're not excluded from the responsibility. Children are called to obey and honor both. But the father has ultimate responsibility. You can compare it to Scripture with Scripture. Ephesians 6, 4 says, and what? Ye fathers, what? Provoke not your children to what? Wrath. Must be pretty interesting that fathers have a hot temper, right? Who's a guy who has a pretty hot temper? You're a bunch of liars. I'm the only one? Let's watch a football game and let's watch politics someday. Let's watch our children disobey and see you not get hot. We can provoke our children to wrath. But what's it tell us to do? But bring them up in the nurture and admon admonition of the Lord. It is the ultimate responsibility of the Father. Fathers need to stand up to teach the Word of God to their children. Ultimately, fathers, and if you want to turn to Ephesians, fathers or husbands are to love their wives as what? As Christ has loved the church, what? Gave his life for it, right? Ephesians 5.25. You can go back and forth to Ephesians 5, and if Colossians says it a little bit differently, but... It's the same. God's word does not contradict. But it's the husbands who love their wives, and as Christ has also loved the church and gave himself for it. He sacrificed his life for, his, for the church, you and I. And then he did this, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water, but by what? By the word. By definition, you and I are to set apart our families as husbands, as dads, Set apart our family, purify them and cleanse them with the washing of the water by the Word. The Word of God shall have a powerful impact in your home life. Teaching our children the Word of God. It doesn't start at the church. It starts at home. If we're expecting our church to raise our children... We're in bad shape. If we're expecting our TV, our YouTube, TikTok, whatever you want to say, it's Snapchat to educate our children, good luck, because you're going to be of this world. It starts with the home. It starts with the man. It starts with the husband, the father, teaching the Word of God, raising them up in the Word of God. It starts with them. 
Now, if you go back to Colossians, you and I as fathers or husbands, grandfathers, we're not to provoke our children, you know, not to provoke them to wrath, to, to, to exasperate anger. We're not to stir up anger in our children. In other words, we're not to correct our, our kids in such a way that they can come embittered, very bitter towards you, because we can. We can be so harsh on our children and squash the spirit. My son Nolan has a lot of spirit, a lot of it, very energetic, and I can squash it to where he's mute, but that's not God's desire. He wants to shape and mold my son to be a thriving young gentleman, man one day, for his honor and glory. That's my job to get him there as a father. We're not to squash him. We're not to be a discourager. We're to be an encourager. We're to praise them and make sure they know that we're proud to be their dad. Do you know, I ask myself all the time, do I know my children's love language? Do you know what makes them tick? Love language, if you don't know what it is, I can get your book on it. It's words of affirmation. Real simple things. Praising them. Acts of service. Receiving gifts. Quality time. Physical touch. Kids want what? What do they want? Your time. But do we give it? And actually one of the best ways to love our children is to love your spouse first. That's why God has that there. In Ephesians there and in Colossians, love your wife as Christ is what? Love the church. He gave himself forward. Nothing is better for a, a child to see is for you to love your wife. Children are sensitive to feelings. And they will sense love or issues. And they always do. Do you ever see a child walk through a store? Well, my kids do it all the time. When they point out certain things, why is that person there crying? Why is that person really upset? They notice those things. We become dull to it. We become dull to it sometimes. Children can sh share a lot of light to us. They read us all the time. I got four of them. They remind me every day. Now, moms and wives... I will say you play a very important part in this as well. And we'll get, we're going to get to that soon. But I want to deal with the fathers still. Is that we're not to provoke our children, but bring them up in, nur in a nurture and admonition of the Lord. And that bring them up means to nurture to maturity. God places the responsibility to raise up children squarely on the, sol the shoulders of parents. They are your kids. Or kids, kid or kids, from the Lord. Own it and take care of them, right? They're not the school's kids. They're my kids. I received a text message the other day from a teacher. It was from Dojo. It was an app. I never heard of the thing before, but it's a Dojo app. Amazing, right? It was an app. It was like, do you know how to be a parent? If you do not, here are some things that we can teach your children and teach you how to be a parent. Do you have a safe place in your house? Do you know how to be an encouragement to your child? I, I answered all these questions by yes, 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 yes. At the bottom, I gave an explanation really respectfully and nicely because she's a nice teacher. And I said, I am the parent. If my kid's a meatball, get a hold of me. I'll deal with it. They're my kids. I am the father. Liz is the mother. They're our responsibility. There's God's blueprints in here for her and I to raise our children. They're not the church's kids. They're my kids. If you're a parent here and you have children, I'm not their daddy. You're the dad and mom. It is your responsibility to take care of them. To raise them up. 
in God's word. Do it the way God says to do it. You cannot be focused on how the church is going to raise your children. It is squarely on the family, the mom and dad. And that's our jobs. And we're to bring them up from God's word. We're to bring them up and nurture an admonition of the Lord. And the training and instruction has to do with teaching and discipline. God has given fathers the primary, primary, primary biblical role for childbearing. And they should teach kids in, uh, God's divine guidelines on their own level and break it down in such a way that they can grasp it. Right? We here at the Altoona Bible Church preach the word of God rightly divided. What in the world does that even mean to a child? It doesn't mean anything to them. Unless you what? Explain the definition. You have to help them ex understand God's word and God's dealings with mankind through the ages. That God's dealings with mankind has changed. You have to explain those things. We want explanations of why. So do children. They have to be able to, they have to, be able to grasp it. We must give them the age-appropriate discipline, not in anger. It says, fathers, provoke not your children, what? To anger, lest they be what? Discouraged. Not in anger, but in love. If it's in anger, it will lead to physical abuse every time. And you have a greater chance of not raising your children the way God has designed us to raise them. Discipline, discipline should be done in love. A great verse, for example, is Genesis 18 and 19. I love when he talks about Abraham here. He tells, this is before he tells him about Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot being there. But look what he says about Abraham. We have the Godhead here talking, by the way. But for I know him, talking about Abraham, that he will what? Command his children and who? His household after who? After him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. So dads, you are needed and the kids are depending upon us as fathers. And maybe your grandfather raising your grandson. Do it the way God says. They're depending on us. They're depending on the dad to show them what love truly is. Which leads me to the verse that we talked a little bit about. Verse 19. Husband, love your wives and be not bitter against them. The word used here for love is agape, which is generally viewed as the highest form of love. This word describes a kind of love that is based on an act of will, not of the emotions. It is embodied in most marriage vows with the words, I do. This is God's kind of love. He loved us not so much on the basis of emotions, but on the knowledge that we had a need, you and I. Separation through what? Sin. That only He could fill, which is salvation through Jesus Christ. And likewise, as husbands, love towards his wife ought to be that which sees her needs and takes action to fulfill them to the best of his ability with God's help. Let me say that again for husbands. Likewise, a, husband love, a husband's love towards his wife ought to be that which sees her needs and I like the next word. And takes what? Action. Not to sit back and let the world take care of it. It's your responsibility to fulfill them to the best of your ability with God's help. But, here's a reminder to all husbands. Don't be bitter. I find it very interesting when you read God's word, he puts certain things in there, right? He puts certain words in there. It's kind of like when you read about the Benjamites, right? And all of a sudden, every Benjamite's a left-handed Benjamite. And you're like, why is he left-handed? I don't know. God has it in there for our, to our read and to study it. 
But here he says in multiple different occasions that you and I, as husbands we can, as, or dads, we can, we can provoke our children. Why does it say about the wife doing that? Why does it always say that we're bitter? Maybe he knows who? The guy's nature. We can become bitter. Do not be bitter against your wife. Don't be bitter. The word bitter literally means to cut or prick. Few things are more hurtful to a wife than a husband who is always cutting her down and taking pokes at her. This is especially difficult when it is also done in public. But bitterness not only hurts the wife, it is damaging to the husband who harbors it. Here's a verse of scripture for you, for us men. Looking diligently, in Hebrews 12, verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of what? Bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Bitterness has a deep root and can spring up at any time. This is why husbands are warned not to allow this sin to take root in their lives, especially toward their wives. And listen, the reason we have a lot of issues in our society is because there are men who do not want to do it God's way. And they want to do it the world's way. Now let's say your kids are grown up or there's maybe already a divorce God knows. You can only start right now with where you're at. When you read God's Word, you read it right now, and He convicts you right now through His Word. The living Word convicts you. And you can only deal with the issues of your life when? Right now. So deal with it. Start right now where you are. Pray for young families. And be part of the solution by giving guidance to young men who are being silly. If we want a thriving society, it does start with the husband. And then it also continues with the wife. Because, let me say this, the wife is the co-warrior. How can we have a thriving society? Well, we need wives also to stand up. Rise to the occasion. Verse 18 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as is what? Fit in the Lord. You are your husband's co-warrior or companion helper. And you need to also know the love languages for your kids as well. And also love your husband first. Encourage your husband to lead you and your kids. There are plenty of tremendous women in the Bible that have taken a stand for what God desires. Plenty of them. Many of women in the Bible. And let me tell you, each one of those women were blessed by it. They were blessed by doing it God's way. Being a wife is not taking a backseat to the husband. Husbands need to hear that as well. It's allowing certain, but what it does is this. Allowing the husband to lead, it allows certain pressures or stressors in life for the husband to deal with and not you. Let me give you an illustration. I read this from a devotional from Pastor Tony Evans. It was a book for men, a devotional for men, a challenging book. He was telling about a time that his daughter came to him and was talking about their financial struggle that his son-in-law and his daughter was dealing with. Tony went on to say that his daughter came to him for help, and he said, I hear what you're saying, but you need to allow your husband to lead your house and to take full responsibility. Go home. She came back to him again. He, she asked the same question. She said, I don't think you heard me again. It is your husband's responsibility to take care of you. Go home. She then goes home, tells his, her husband, the son-in-law, my dad will not help unless you talk to him. She was upset. 
But you know what he did? He went and talked to his father-in-law. And then he goes on and says that he did end up helping them and helped them out financially. But you know what the result of that was? Let me tell you the result of it. That man took ownership of what God has gifted him. He started thriving as a husband, taking responsibility. He started thriving as a father and a man of God. And from the words of his daughter, it was a better marriage and still is. Because it's the father's, it's the husband's responsibility to do what? To take care of the wife and the family. Words from their mouth. It's not saying that, this is not saying, again, women taking a back seat, submitting yourselves to your husband. It's not saying that at all. It's not saying the woman has no opinion. The husband should never rule over the wives as they are something smaller. Their co-warriors, the opinions and the emotions should and they do matter. They do matter. Let's look at some example, an example of God's Word, of a wife and husband that functioned in God's Word. Go here to the book of Acts, Acts 18. Acts 18. Acts 18. Let me show you a couple here who they were co-warriors together. You don't see the husband belittling the wife. You don't see the wife belittling the husband. But they're working together for, for God's glory. Acts 18, verse 1. Paul meets these individuals by his own trade skill. Well, what was Paul's trade skill? Being a tent maker. These folks were tent makers. Paul uses his trade skill, meets these, this dynamic individual couple. Verse 1, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, Italy, come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought for by their occupation they were what? Tent makers. These individuals hung out with Paul, heard about the gospel of the grace of God, got on fire for God's word, and then you also see in verse 24 how God used their marriage for his honor and glory. Verse 24 A certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexander, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom, he, whom went Aquila and who? Priscilla. Both of them, by the way, had heard. They took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God, what? More perfectly. God used these individuals, this couple, for His honor and glory to help an individual who didn't understand what God's dealings and that they've changed and God's raising up the Apostle Paul and ushering in the dispensation of grace. He didn't understand that because all he was teaching about was a John the Baptist. They expounded unto him the Word of God more perfectly and God then uses Apollos to preach the word perfectly. God uses a couple together for his honor and glory. A man, does, yes, has a sole responsibility of being the spiritual leader of the house, but he is not a dictator. Not a dictator. Not a dictator at all. This couple here, uh, Aquila and Persuila, Paul tells them that what? What were they? Greek, Persuila and Aquila, what? My helpers in Christ Jesus. Just because God labeled Eve as Adam's helper 
does not mean that she's being belittled at all. This couple was dynamic. Together they were. God used them mightily. Women can play a very important part of society. And there are many women, like I said, in the Bible that have and can be an encouragement to you. So if you go back to our passage in Colossians, the wife is to encourage the husband to lead the family and to stand with him. Just the other day, Liz and I were driving, just to give an idea as you're turning back, how does this work? Her and I function differently. Liz thinks that she just said this the other day. I said, you know, she says, well, you don't really think of a lot of things. You just go and you just do, boom. You take action, you take charge, right? You just boom. And then, I, and then she says, but I, I like to really think about things, right? She's really diligent. And she is. She's very diligently. She really thinks about things. She, she thinks about all the scenarios, scenarios, whatever you want to call it. But she said, but no, you, but it's needed that when things need to get done, you get it done. Okay? We work well together in that way. Together. This is togetherness. This whole passage is togetherness. And you're doing it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God desires that the husband lead the family, not to be bitter, not to be discouraging to, ch to the children. He also expects the husband to love their wives as Christ has loved the church and gave himself for it. He expects, his word says, that the wives encourage their husbands to lead the family and to help and to be part of the ministry and to be part of raising the children up as well. God desires women to encourage the husband to lead the family and stand with him. Now, I want to be sensitive here as well. We are not perfect, are we? Who's perfect? Nobody. If you are, get out the door. There's no such thing as perfect. The only perfect thing is the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not perfect, and if you think you are, congratulations, but these are blueprints for marriage for a reason. God's design is the best and it does have the best results. But just like anything, we all need to work on our marriages. There are plenty of resources out there, but I'm going to encourage one thing, because I went to it multiple different times, is a weekend to remember. We plan on taking another group in October 2024, but there's plenty of weekend to remembers in the USA. Pick one, go to it. The last one that the church went, there was over 3,000 people in Hershey, ages in marriages ranging from all over. New marriages, marriages for over 60-some years. All you know when you're there is this, which is the best part. There is no judgment at all. If you want a thriving society, it starts with the husband, and then it also continues with the wife. And with a husband and a wife thriving, I'm telling you first and foremost, if both men and women stand up together, the children will what? Stand up. They will. Verse 20 says, we all want this as parents and grandparents. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Sophia, you got to obey your parents in all things. Forget about it. Right? I love embarrassing her. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. This is a lot easier, and children will obey, and they will follow if the father and mother are leading what? Correctly. There are many times when we have kids go up to Grace Kids Camp, they get saved, or they get encouraged, or they get inspired by God's Word, and then they come to a counselor and they say, I don't know what to do when I get home because my parents don't go to church. They don't care about God. What do you do? What do you say? We tell them to pray for their parents. Tell them to be encouraging to their parents. Not to disrespect their parents, but to pray for their salvation. Right? We pray for those children when they leave because they go to that home. 
If we want a thriving society, the parents have to stand up if we want the children to stand up. There's a passage in, Ex- you know, in the book of Judges. The nation of Israel kept what? God sent a judge to what? Save them, right? And all of a sudden, a judge came and saved them. And all of a sudden, they went back to what? Other nations, worshiping idols and worshiping heathen things, doing what other nations were doing. Everything was all great and dandy. But right in Judges 2, it talks about the fact. How did they get to this point? Because their fathers never talked about the miracles and wonders of God. None of those kids knew when they grew up about the splitting of the Red Sea. None of them. If we saw an amazing event here in Pennsylvania, out Tuna, and all of a sudden you went to Lake Racetown, and you're in a pontoon boat, and all of a sudden that lake just splits in half, you think you'd tell your family? Absolutely. You absolutely would. They didn't. What I'm trying to get at, it starts... With the parents. Parents stand up, the children will stand up. I want you to go to the book of Psalms real quick. Psalms. Psalms 127. Why am I so passionate about this? One, I got four children. Two, I am so sick and tired of what the world is trying to tell parents to do. And I'm sick and tired of parents looking to other sources of stuff to raise their own children. God gives us the blueprints today. Someone's asking for the blueprints too. Psalms 127 verse 3. We have to lead by example. Psalm 127 verse 3. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. As arrows are in the hand of, the mighty man, of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Verse 3, children are intended to be received and valued as a gift from the Lord. A reward. I get tired of hearing when people say someone has a baby and they say, good luck. That's ridiculous. God says it's a reward, it's a gift. It's a gift from God. They should be received as a wonderful inheritance. And they should receive care and training, that nurture and admonition. But they're not also to be staying at home and living in the basement all day long. Arrows are meant to fly at a target, are they not? Verse 4 says, children are, her- no, are as arrows, talking about the children, verse 4, are in the hand of the mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Arrows are meant to fly at a target. You and I are ambassadors for Christ. If you accept Christ as your personal Savior, we're to raise our children in the Lord and then let them fly in the Lord. We're to encourage them to do what the Lord is leading them to do and not to discourage them, whatever it is. You did your part. Now trust God. And let go. You did your part, now let the Lord lead them and encourage them by praying and always having a listening ear for them. And fathers, verse 5, people always think I'm nuts for this. Happy you are when your quiver is full of them. A quiver is indeed the case for carrying arrows. Happy you are when your children are serving the Lord and whatever the Lord leads them to do. Amen? Amen. Never look at a family with lots of children. You should encourage them. Because there is not one place in the Bible where God says to stop being fruitful and multiplying. As long as they're doing it in the Lord. Praise God for young families and please pray for young families. Pray for children. Pray for our Wednesday night clubs. Pray for our Christmas parade because there's going to be lots of children that receive the gospel track with a little lollipop. They need our prayers. And they need people, parents, men and women to stand up to be that guide, to be that hand, that helper. 
pray for our country. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and grace. Father, we, we desire and we... We desire a thriving country here. We thank you for the freedom that the United States still has. Father, we pray for all the families around us and many that are hurting, broken families, blended families. Help us to be able to minister to them, Father. Help your word to encourage them. Help us all to stand up for you, to be bold in our faith, to be bold and, and to be that man or to be that woman that can be that light to the lost. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love and grace. We thank you for everything we have because of the Lord Jesus Christ. We look forward to the day we're with you, but until then, Father, use us mightily in our respective areas. We pray for our young families that we do have here in the church and all the young kids. Protect us. And just keep letting us shine. In Jesus' name, amen.